Well, thank you very much and good morning. Thank you to the Manning Center for including this topic on the agenda. Because when we phrase it as a question, as the title is, what's getting in the way of school choice, I would suggest that before we even talk about some of the, the policy implications and options, and we'll do a bit of that this morning as well, I think there's a larger cultural question that needs to be framed in terms of how certain words are even used and understood. And that's in the culture at large, but it is also within the conservative family. I would suggest that our biggest challenge um, in dealing with the challenge of school choice is a monopoly mindset or worldview that has premised our understanding of education. In common parlance today, if I say education, it has become synonymous with the public education system, the state-run education system. People just assume that is education in Canada today, and anything that happens outside of that is on the margins and therefore isn't really education. And so I would say our greatest challenge, and really that's the thrust of my remarks today, is what will it take to overcome the monopoly mindset? Because if we're actually going to see concrete specific change driven by realities, we first have to condition the environment in which there is a different understanding of what education is today. I'm going to be presenting some data in a few moments that we've gathered regarding the outcomes of non-state education. Uh, we've collected data in both Canada and the United States. Whenever I present this data, I try to make the point that all education is public education. Public education is education for the common good. And whether or not you're educated, in a, uh, the funding of the school and the governance of the school should not determine whether or not it's actually education in the public interest and in the common good. Now, I think that one of the things that is going to be the impetus for change in education, and I think we are going to see a significant debate of education in the next decade or two, is going to be the general decline of education in comparison to world standards. Um, in North America, we're, ac we're accustomed to looking at results very much in terms of how, how the provinces compare with each other, how we compare with the United States. The reality is we live in a global economy, and global education rankings are more important, and Canada isn't doing all that well. You may recall in December when the latest PISA uh, rankings were uh, released, and K-12 education was slown, shown to be slipping compared to our competitors, especially in the area of mathematics, but also in some other areas. There were a whole series of headlines for at least a couple of weeks before uh, the media moved on to other things. And it was interesting, uh, the Globe and Mail on December the 3rd talked about Canada's fall in math education is setting off alarm bells. Uh, we're 13th in mathematics uh, in an OECD study. John Manley, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Council of uh, Chief Executives, said, quote, this is on a scale of a national emergency. And yet what's interesting is as that conversation continued, it was almost as if the only answer was how do we fix the public government-run education system. And some of the other aspects of um, the education process, which about 8% um, depends on how you define. There's lots of hybrids, and we'll get into that. So numbers aren't easy to come by. But basically in Canada, about 8% of students are educated outside of the government education system. Now, it's interesting because this monopoly mindset regarding public education, I would argue, is a particularly North American phenomenon. Um, when you think of education in Europe, you think of undoubtedly the dominant public education system today. And yet, you may be surprised by this map provided by the European Commission. About 14% of students in Europe are educated outside of the public education system, almost double the rate of Canada. In fact, the shaded blue are the only areas where, in fact, there is no parental choice in terms of where education, how education is provided. So there's a wide variety, even in country, you know, people are always surprised when I say 
You think of public education, you think of socialist Sweden. 13% of students in Sweden are educated outside of the government-run education system. And there are various models in place. Now, in 15 minutes, we can't go around the world and look at all the different sort of models. My point simply is the presumption of monopoly around a public education system is a particularly North American way in terms of the conversation. The other aspect is that it's not a homogeneous discussion even within Canada. Some of you may have noticed, I think it was Thursday of this week, that uh, Fraser released an excellent report, um, sort of a lit survey as well as the state of school choice across the country. And as you see, in terms of alternative schools in Canada, it ranges, Alberta is um, 60 to 70 percent. Um, in Saskatchewan, there's 50 to 80 percent, although Aboriginal education is part and parcel of those those numbers as well. BC um, is 35 to 50 percent. So if you educate your child in a non-government school system, you actually get some public funding in those jurisdictions. On the other hand, Ontario, Quebec, and Eastern, <laughs> you get zero. And in fact, Cardis will be releasing a paper in a, a couple of months' time that we have commissioned looking at Ontario specifically, in which we highlight not only don't you get funding, there are a whole pile of government policies which are designed to make it more problematic and expensive to even operate outside. So you're, you're, you're punished. Not only don't you receive what one might argue is, is should be yours, but you're punished as well. I think it's also important to note that when we talk about alternative models of education, we're not talking about a bipolar thing as if there's a government school system and then there are private schools. And there are quite a range of options. And it's interesting, the States is about a decade ahead of us in this particular conversation. I spoke at a school choice conference in Fort Lauderdale in, um, in January. It was interesting to note just the difference you know, you have some advocating for voucher systems, and there's some experimentation happening there. But you've got charter schools, you've got systems in which there's public support for alternative schools. Uh, you've got scholarship programs in which businesses can direct their taxes, basically direct their taxes into a scholarship program that then can go to fund um, schools. Some of that's motivated by parental choice. Um, often religiously, um, about half the time religiously motivated. Many of it is actually poverty alleviation programs in terms of many inner city uh, poverty programs are being driven around alternative to the school sector. It's very interesting in California, there's a movement in terms of magnet schools in which if a public school is underperforming, parents effectively can take over the school within the public system, elect their own, hire their own principal and and basically a populist takeover to take it away from the school boards. So without getting into all the particulars, it's important to note that it isn't just public education or independent schools, but there's an entire continuum of options out there to consider. One of the things Curtis has been involved in over the last couple of years as we began looking at that is recognizing that we're engaging in a debate or a conversation that is ideologically laden. The minute you say school choice, people have you labeled in a particular way. We've collected a significant amount of data, a little bit of which I'm going to share with you, but one of the things that we have chosen to do is interpret the data through the lens of the purposes of education as outlined in the Education Act. Now, these acts vary across the country, but essentially they're the same. So I cite Ontario's here. The Ontario Education Act says the purpose of education is to provide students with the opportunity to realize their potential and develop into highly skilled, knowledgeable, caring citizens who contribute to their society. So our question was, if that's the purpose of education, can that be achieved outside the public education system? We began in 2011 with a representative sample of the U.S. population. In 2012, we did a survey of the Canadian population. That has led to the creation of a research center at the University of Notre Dame, the Cardiff Religious Schools Initiative. And actually, right now, we are in the field in the States again, using a professional polling company to get a representative sample of the adult population. So what we are doing is we're going to 23 to 39-year-olds. We're asking them, where did you go to school? We look up the high schools. We categorize them into the different categories. And we're trying to see if there are statistically significant differences 
between those who went to public school and those who went to other schools in these areas. So I'll just give you a bit of a snapshot of what we've done. Our questionnaire is 133 questions, and it's quite comprehensive. We basically follow the student from high school all the way in terms of their university experience, so we get all of their academic achievement, family background, occupational goals, do they vote, what are their attitudes on issues, um, a fairly comprehensive survey. And then we control it. So I think cause usually when you present this data, people say, well, of course, people, there's a self-selection of those who are going to private schools. They're, you know, richer. Sometimes the caricature is that private schools are um, for rich, rich folk and, and religious kooks. That's sort of the public perception out there. Um, so what we've done is we've actually controlled for 23 social, economic, and religious variables. So what we are comparing, think of, you've got 200 kids, put them into two groups of 100. Within each group of 100, you've got the same amount of rich and poor, same family status, same religious background, all of the other. We send 100 kids to public school, we send 100 kids to other schools, and we check up 15 to 20 years later to see is there any difference, and we control. So that's the data. That's the basis on which the data I'm going to show you has been there. So first of all, this is Canadian data collected by Angus Reid in the spring of 2012. I'm just going to give you some top of line results. Um, this stuff is all being published in papers and academic journals and, and there are reports on the CARDIS website that you can download free of charge if you want a more comprehensive view. This is just a very quick snapshot. One of the purposes of the Education Act was educational achievement. So how are they doing? The green line is the public school graduate. So if it's above the line, they're doing, they've got more than public school graduates. If it's below the line, they've got less. So as you see, if you graduated from a Catholic, Protestant, or non-religion, those are academically defined schools, could be Upper Canada College, could be a Montessori school, a Waldorf school, any of those sorts of schools, they would fit in that category. It's quite clear that those who went to non, who were uh, educated outside the public education system, with the exception of homeschoolers, actually have more years of, of post-secondary education, total years. The homeschoolers actually is a very interesting phenomena. The homeschoolers, if you go by total years, are less. If you actually want to go PhDs per capita, the, you're most likely to get a PhD if you're a homeschooler. So those that go, go a whole lot further. But many of them stop and do not have further post-secondary. So very interesting um, sort of bifurcated results uh, in terms of that, which averages sometimes are misleading. Well, that's fine, they went on. Was it due to something else? What's their own assessment of their high school experience? As you see, overwhelmingly, if you ask people who went to outside of the public education system, their evaluation of their own high school experience retrospectively as an adult is overwhelmingly positive compared to the public school system. Well, you might say, okay, but that's their total private-minded. They're not concerned about the public good. So we asked them a whole series of questions on social attitudes regarding all sorts of issues. Um, check the report to get the complete. I just threw the environment up on here because I think it'll be counterintuitive to some. If you're educated on outside of the public education system, you are far more likely to be concerned about the environment than if you went to a public school as an adult. And in fact, we had a whole bevy of questions when it came to do you recycle um, your personal practices, on that regard, you're far more likely to engage in those practices. However, if you participated in the environmental movement, well, if you're, um, depends what sort of school you went to. If you actually went to a, a Protestant school or a home school, you're far more suspicious of the environmental movement. So you're environmental in practice, but you're skeptical about the environmental movement. Participation in um, politics, and uh, we asked joining a political party, campaign donations, did you vote, all of those sorts of questions. Interesting, Catholics are disengaged from the public process, whereas those who are in uh, Protestant or independent schools, or even homeschoolers, tend to be more engaged than public school graduates. And I'm only showing, by the way, statistically significant results. If it's on here, the results are statistically significant. What about the job that you have? Well. One of the challenges for those in the education, alternative education system is that when it comes to creativity, 
Some sectors are doing very well and some not so well. Which actually, and the argument I'm going to make at the end, is that if you want to improve the public education system, you, eat, you need competition at the edges. You need to view what's happening around and learn from. So I would suggest there are some significant learnings that could be had from the independent non-religious schools and the Catholic schools in terms of creativity, in terms of what we might want to do if we need a more creative and entrepreneurial workforce. On the other hand, we may take a look at some of the Protestant schools and maybe there are some things there that we may learn what not to do. One of the big areas is volunteering in terms of engagement with society. Are these people engaged in society as adults? Well, they're very involved, um, especially on the Protestant side, in their own religious communities. And there's other data that shows that overwhelmingly. 80% of the volunteering, 80% of the charitable giving in Canada comes from 29% of the population. 23 of that 29% likely attended a place of worship in the last seven days. Stats Canada data. Um, they provide the civic oxygen, if you will, that allows our social, social ecology to thrive. Now you say, okay, they're committed to their own congregation. What about, what about society as a whole? Well, as you see, with the exception of homeschoolers and separate Catholic schoolers, independent Catholics, independent non-religion and Protestant schoolers are far more likely to be involved and donate. And remember, they're do they still have 168 hours a week. They're doing this in their church. Plus, if we add up the baseball teams they're coaching, the YMCA and all of the other things, they're far more likely to, um, to be involved. I'm getting the wave here, so I'm going to mm -hmm. do the rest in a very fast-forward way. Um, spirituality, uh, they are um, it, obviously about half of these schools are religiously motivated, and they are achieving some of their religious outcomes. And they are crediting their high school experience for contributing to that. They are much less likely to be divorced. More like they marry younger, have more kids, divorce less. Um, so there you see that. So it brings us back to our core question in terms of what's the purpose of education. And I go back to the Education Act. I highlighted there, the purpose of education is to provide students with the opportunity to develop their potential. If you were graduating outside the public education system, you've got more academic achievement, and there are many other ways of measuring that, but quite clearly the data shows it's achieving that. It is um, develop highly skilled, knowledgeable, caring citizens. I think the data that I showed you indicates the sort of result. The big argument that's always is, wait a minute, these are private schools, we need public schools to learn with each other and to contribute to society. Well, the data actually shows that those educated outside the public system do a better job of that than those within the public system. So I suggest we have a challenge, and the challenge is overcoming our monopoly mindset of education and begin sharing the facts to condition the environment so that before too long, we really will see school choice in Canada. Thank you. <laughs>